All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Like I said, my name's Evan Lowy. Uh, I'm new with uh, Fort Orthopedic Institute, about four months now. Um, but as she mentioned, I am a local uh, guy. I was born and raised in Winter Haven, Florida, not too far away. Yeah, woo, Winter Haven. Uh, did uh, undergraduate University of Florida up in Gainesville, uh, medical school down in Miami, the University of Miami, and then um, up in Tampa with the University of South Florida, did my uh, orthopedic residency, and then uh, was up in Charlotte for a year, uh, focusing on foot and ankle orthopedics uh, at uh, Ortho Carolina, uh, which is similar practice to uh, FOI, a little bit bigger, but uh, generally the same kind of deal um, in terms of their practice. Um, so today I just wanted to go over a couple main co uh, common causes of foot and ankle pain um, and issues, um, talk about them, kind of go over a little bit, give you a little insight into what, when I see a patient like that in my office, um, what I do, what I'm looking at, and kind of what I like to talk about and explain. Um, and then uh, also if you have this or know someone that has this, uh, maybe offer you a little bit of, an, uh, of a bonus and kind of initial treatments of things that you can get started on and hopefully get rid of that pain or uh, make it a lot more tolerable for you. This way, okay. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit about heel pain, mostly plantar heel pain, uh, and then uh, also about flat foot. Um, so I don't wanna get too academic today, but uh, like you mentioned, I kinda I like to um, go over some basics in terms of education with my patients and about what their condition is and the specifics of that. So I think that makes us, we are able to get on the same page with some terminology and just kinda why I'm saying we should do what, what I'm saying and not just that, oh, you should do this and it'll get better, but why is that the case? Um, so uh, this is the starting with the heel pain. On your left, uh, that's just the bottom of the foot, basically just showing the plantar fascia. And so the important thing with that is it's a fibrous tissue. It's not very stretchy um, and it doesn't have great blood flow. It goes on the bottom of your foot, starts at the bottom of your heel bone, kind of in the middle, uh, and then goes out all the way to your toes. And so we're gonna make a fun party trick or if you wanna feel it yourself. Um, if you bend your toes back, that makes the tissue tight on the bottom of your foot and that kind of band that pops out, that's the plantar fascia. Um, helps hold up your arch, uh, and that's part of the components of it. And then on the other side, that's just kind of looking at your heel pad or the, the fat pad underneath your heel bone. Um, normally it's that um, spongy, it's a fatty tissue, but it's spongy, elastic, kind of gives you a good cushion. And then um, as it becomes less useful, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but not so much that the volume is gone or that it doesn't necessarily go away, but it's just not as spongy or it's not as cushiony as it should be. Um, briefly on uh, heel pain uh, imaging, so this is a lateral x-ray, and just something I'd like to talk about, because common misconception um, that a heel spur is the reason for the pain. Um, so there's no evidence that we have in medical, you know, our research that that is actually the case, and so um, estimated about 10% of people in, in general have a heel spur. Uh, only about 50% of people that have a heel spur actually ever have pain. Um, it's just, it's not actually attached to the plantar fascia, it's near it. Um, but there's no, no reason to believe that, that we've seen that actually removing that will get rid of any pain. Um, sometimes it could actually make things worse. Um, hopefully that's showing up a little bit, but basically that's just showing the bottom of your foot. So in terms of an exam is where does it hurt kind of keys us into what's going on. Um, and so basically it, you may not be able to see well, but in the front part of your heel pad or the round part where your heel is on the bottom, kind of on the front of that, on the inside of your foot on the instep, that's where the plantar fasciitis, that's where it hurts. And that's where if you come in and I think that's what you have, I'll push right there. And then you're gonna say, how did you know that's where it hurts? Um, typically that's what I say, that's why we go to school for so long, so we're efficient and we know how to hurt you. Um, then if it's central heel pain or something else that we'll talk about in a minute, that's more just right in the middle and the center on the bottom, dead center underneath your heel. Um, that's where that hurts typically. And so if plantar fasciitis, similar to, uh, it's actually similar from a disease process to tennis elbow, which is pretty common, or lateral epicondylitis. So it's not really an inflammatory condition, even though the name kind of infers that. It's really more of a degenerative process. And so what happens is in these tissues that don't have great blood flow, what we think happens is that you get a small tear or very small injury that's really not you know, anything major, but it, since it doesn't have good blood flow, it doesn't really heal. And so it kind of heals with scar tissue, and then that can tear a little bit. And so it kind of smolders and has this, uh, this kind of circular effect that can happen and kind of smolder for a little while. Um, it's hard to rest it because you gotta walk and similar like with tennis elbow, you gotta use your hands and so that's why it kinda can smolder like that and kinda continue. 
Um, like I said, it's more of a degenerative process than an inflammatory process, um, which is important because anti-inflammatories aren't always helpful um, with this condition because there's not inflammation for it to treat always. Uh, classically, with plantar fasciitis, we say it's the worst step. The first, excuse me, the first step in the morning is the worst step of the day. So a lot of times what happens is you get tight overnight, kind of everything, um, your calf muscles and your feet, everything kind of tightens up while you're sleeping, and you step down and it re-tears. And then you walk for a little bit and you say, okay, it loosens up, I feel a little bit better, it doesn't hurt quite as much, but you know what? The more I'm on it all day, then it starts hurting again and gets worse and worse again. And that's more because, as I said, when you bend your toes back, so when you walk, every time you step over the top, your toes get pulled and that pulls on that tissue and just kind of aggravates it throughout the day. And so that's why that happens. So with treatment, I would say it was one of the most important treatment regimens was education. So that's kind of why I would get, talk about all the background things so that I can explain kind of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, tell patients that the good news is, is that 90 to 95% of the time this will get better without any surgery or without any big major treatments. The less good news is that it can take up to a year to do that. Uh, not always, and it doesn't typically take that long, but it can take that long. Um, the most important thing of all, the, it's a million dollar market, if you Google it or search for it or talk with people, you hear about all kinds of inventions, gadgets, treatments you can buy. Um, really the best thing that we have that's been shown with research over and over again is a specific stretching program. Uh, and I'll show you that, kind of the specifics of that here in a minute, but basically stretching your calf and then also trying to stretch the tissue on the bottom or actually stretch the plantar fascia. Like anything with stretching, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes typically about six weeks till you really start feeling some difference and then, you know, to continue to improve with time. Um, but it does take time and typically does work. Uh, night splints is basically, I'll show a picture of that. It's basically like a, a boot or something that you wear on your heel that keeps your uh, ankle at 90 degrees. So it keeps you from kind of crimping down or kind of tightening down overnight. Um, I, I don't think I could sleep with that on my foot, so I usually don't necessarily recommend it. We talk about it in case you think you could. And usually it's really just shown to be helpful as an adjunct in addition to stretching, so not taking the place of stretching. And I also tell people that if you don't think you could sleep with that, don't worry if you just stretch and do these stretches before you put your foot down, it's probably pretty similar effect that way. Um, there's no evidence that custom orthotics are gonna change this at all. Some people, if you have a significant flat foot or other problem, that may help it. Um, but I wouldn't feel like you have to spend money on a custom orthotic for this problem specifically. Um, and there's some over-the-counter ones, just like a cushion or, you know, a Dr. Scholl's type of thing that's just soft or padding into that area is probably just as beneficial. Um, sometimes anti-inflammatories will help, like I said, sometimes not, and basically gauge that kind of on how your exam is and how bad it is and associated conditions. So the left there, that's a picture of a night splint. That's one version. There's tons of versions of them. I actually have one uh, It's called a Strasbourg sock. It's kind of like a big tube sock that comes off and then you wrap around your leg. It's pretty crazy looking, but uh, basically just trying to keep your ankle from getting, pointing your toes down overnight. And then that's just a kind of a cushion there on the, uh, for a heel cushion for your shoes that you could get, something like that. Um, this is the stretches uh, that we talk about and have a handout that I can give patients, but um, the key is having your knee straight. And so if it's up on something on a chair, ottoman, or on the couch with you, and then using something that's that's uh, non-elastic, so like a belt or a rope, luggage strap, something like that, towel, and then putting that around the ball of your foot and pulling back and stretching. You should feel it stretch all the way up behind your knee, and so that's the important part there. And so that's the, the, one of the major stretches. I usually we do that with a non-weight bearing. Rather than putting your foot up against, you know, kind of up against the wall and pushing your foot back, that kind of classic stretch, because that is actually pulling on those toes, and so it's kind of aggravating the plantar fascia. Um, and then the other picture there on the left was just the foot, so that's just the plantar fascia specific stretch. And so the way I kind of describe that, hopefully I don't fall over here. Uh, but say it's your right foot. So if you, you know, cross your legs like so, kind of just figure four. And then if it's your right foot, use your right hand and you come over the top, grab your toes and you're just pulling back, stretching that tissue on the bottom. Uh, and so holding that 10, 15 seconds and then release and doing that, you know, multiple times, like 10 times and doing that a few times a day. It's just really can't stretch it too much and just trying to loosen things up with time, lessen the pressure. Uh, and that can help this kind of let it burn out and let it uh, progress through the stages. So from what um, we call more interventional or kind of more uh, involved treatment options uh, if that doesn't work. And so typically with these, we wait till at least six months of uh, symptoms despite appropriate conservative treatment. So meaning that you've been doing the stretches, you've tried the other, you know, the inserts and 
all this kind of stuff, and you say, hey man, I've done all that, you talked about it, still it's driving me crazy, what are the other options? Um, so there's, a lot of people will do steroid injections, so I personally am not a, a huge fan of it for this condition, um, unless you, you know, if someone crawls in and can't put their foot down, then, then we talk about it, but um, it's not, steroids aren't really good for uh, tissue healing, uh, they're good for inflammation, but as I mentioned, it's not really an inflammatory process. And so sometimes it helps a little bit. The research that we have shows that it can change the symptoms if versus a placebo or just kind of a you know, water injection. It's about a month that it may help symptoms, but it doesn't change the overall course of the disease. Some people will say, hey, I got an injection before and it went away. I kind of liken that to taking antibiotics for a viral infection. So, you know, if you get a cold, it's probably going to get better. Sometimes taking an antibiotic, it may help too, but... Uh, a lot of times it doesn't, but the problem with it is, more importantly, is that it weakens the tissue and so you can rupture the plantar fascia. Problem with that is there's no surgery to repair it. It's a bigger problem. It kind of changes the way you walk and the way your foot works. And, um, you know, then we talk more about custom orthotics and things like that. And so I don't like to really recommend it unless there's a serious problem. Um, but not to say if you've had one before, someone did something wrong to you, but that's just my personal belief and my training. Um, there's shockwave is an option, and so it's actually like what you get for kidney stones. Um, that's an option. It, unfortunately, insurance doesn't cover it. Um, hopefully, there's no insurance uh, people here, but uh, I usually kind of say that that's purely conjecture. No one's told me this, but it's probably too easy for you to get, and that's why they don't want to cover it, because then everyone will be like, yeah, sure, why not? I'll do it. Hey, why not? So um, you kind of, it's out of pocket, unfortunately, but that is something that has been shown to help. Um, there's stem cell type injections. Again, all this is really to try and stimulate blood flow to that area and to try to get it to heal. Uh, so there's different types of stem cell injections that are out there. The one that's probably has the most research behind it is actually amniotic tissue, um, but nevertheless a, a type of stem cell. Um, reasonable evidence behind it. Again, insurance doesn't cover it because it's expensive and um, some people would argue that the research is biased because the companies that own that product sponsor the research. But, Nevertheless, it's an option potentially. Um, and then there's surgery, which either percutaneous, meaning through a small incision, or open, meaning a bigger incision. Insurance will typically cover those, um, but it's a lot more of a recovery standpoint. It's more involved from a treat, you know, uh, from more that you got to put into it and go through. And so that's probably why they why they cover it because it's more of a commitment. All of them in general, from shockwave, stem cells, percutaneous, open surgery, generally speaking, around 85% success rate in the literature and our research. So all generally is similar, but just varying levels of recovery and uh, limitations afterwards. But again, the good news is most of the time don't have to worry about that. Um, as far as central heel pain, just to briefly touch on that, um, you know, risk factors say repetitive steroid injections, inflammatory conditions, repetitive trauma, just degenerative issues. I mean, basically just for some reason that tissue gets worn out or if it gets weakened from steroids or inflammatory conditions, those types of things. Essentially, just it's a lack of cushion on your heel for all intents and purposes. Um, shows a little soft, flattened surface on the heel there. Sometimes you can have some bursitis or some redness and swelling associated with that. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of great options for this. Um, this is when we talk about more specifics in terms of just cushioning with shoes modification or um, inserts. Um, the, you know, our famous, the orthopedic famous, if it hurts, don't do it. Uh, try to avoid things that, that make it worse. Uh, basically what can happen is your bone gets, has less cushion, and so your heel bone kind of get a bruise, and it's really hard to get that to resolve because you got to be up and moving around. And so hopefully the cushions and you know, changing your activities a little bit will let that cool down and not be as bad for you. Um, there's not really any safe, um, consistently shown uh, injectable, you know, replacement cushion or anything like that. Or, tissue, and I always tell patients that if by chance you figure something out, let me know, and we'll, we'll have a lot of time on the beach together. Um, moving on to flat foot, touch a little bit on that. Uh, two general causes of flat foot that I'm going to touch on. Um, so in general, the normal arch of your foot is maintained by a combination of the bones, ligaments, tendons, all those things together. Um, acquire, or acquired flat foot just meaning you weren't necessarily born with it. Uh, you can get that from different causes. The most common cause, and you may have heard of posterior tibial tendon dysfunction or posterior tibial tendonitis, basically has to do with the tendons and ligaments. That's the most common cause. Um, also, you could have something that we call atypical flat foot, which is usually more related to the bones or joints rather than the tendons. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit on both. It's important to know and for the provider to understand because there's a treatment's a little bit different um, um, in terms of these, and so it's important to be able to distinguish those when that happens. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
Sorry. Can we go back? Thanks. Um, so briefly again on the anatomy, so that's just a drawing of the inside part of your ankle. So the posterior tibial tendon is one of the main components that helps with your walking and it's important to use for the arch. Um, it's a start, the muscle starts in the back of your leg and then the tendon runs right around the inside, that inside bone and your ankle runs right behind that bone. It's a pretty narrow, shallow groove that this tendon runs in. Unfortunately, um, there's not good blood flow in that area. So it's kind of set up to fail in a sense, um, but that's, that's the tendon that will, can get injured and get stretched out. The interesting thing about it, at least it's interesting to me, I think, is that this is a really important tendon for your normal gait and walking and your foot posture. The whole tendon that works, it all does is it pulls, and it's two centimeters, that's all it does. It pulls two centimeters, so basically the width of your finger. And so if you imagine, if you have even a minor injury to it that maybe lengthens it by five millimeters, that's 25% of its function is gone, like, just like that. And so that's why it's just very susceptible to injury and to dysfunction. Um, the other picture is just showing it basically comes around and attaches almost the entire bottom of your foot, which kind of shows you that how important it is that it's set up to do that. So there's just a couple x-rays showing. We'll get a little bit more into that in detail, but these are just the bones of the foot from a side view and a top view. But I'll kind of explain the, the importance of that here in a minute. Um, pathophysiology of it, just basically what's going on, why is this happening? So like I said, it's a sharp turn and a narrow groove, kind of has a lot of little injuries to it. There's not good blood flow. And so with time, that kind of stretches out. Usually it doesn't rupture, so to speak, in terms of if you imagine like a rope completely breaking. Usually what it is more is it's with time, it kind of frays and gets stretched out and beat up and raggedy. And then that, it's just once it stretches out too much, it's not working the same. Like if a rubber band is stretched out, it's still there and it's intact, but it's not doing its job. Um, so patients come in, typically a lot of times people say, oh, I have my I've fallen arches. And so it's important for us to understand and to ask you and say, okay, well, is that, is that how you always have been? Is that your foot's always been like that? Or um, does it have a little bit and then recently it changed? Or was it always looked normal and looked like everyone, you know, normal with an arch and then recently that changed? Um, typically in the course of this condition, um, you have a pain on the inside part of your ankle, or we call medial, basically the inside part. It starts there, and then as the condition progresses through later stages, you have pain more on the outside part. Uh, this is what we look at, basically kind of just to show you what's going on. And so the picture on the left is looking at the back of somebody on their heel, and so you can kind of see the one on the left, that line's straight, and so that's typically generally where, you, where your heel should be in relation to your leg. And then on the right, the right part of that picture, you can see that angle there, we call it valgus, or basically that's someone that's knock-kneed, is, we call that valgus. If you're bow-legged, that's varus. But, Basically, this valgus, so the angle is pointing towards the inside of your body. And so that's the, the abnormal side. And then uh, um, we like to call the too many toes sign. Uh, basically, is when I can look from behind and you see in the, on the picture on the right, his right foot, you can see more of his toes than the other side. And that means that it's kind of splayed out or his arch is flattened. Um, just this is what we look at too. I'll have you stand up and look from behind, have you go up on your toes and if your heel's out to the side but then when you stand up it comes in, that's normal and that shows me that it's flexible and that your tendon still works. Um, if that doesn't happen or you can't do it, that means that that tendon's not working. Oh, it's not. Is there a way, I think that slide should be, should have another component to it. Is that not working? Oh, that's too bad. That's all right. We can make it work. Um, does that work? Hopefully. Um, so basically, this is an abnormal x-ray. There's one that I have that's a normal one to show you the difference. It's not working. I apologize for that. But that one I showed before, the important thing to see is that these lines should be basically, it should be one line. So basically, the whole, that part of your foot should be continuous pointing down towards the same. And you can see that it's not. It's broken there. And so this is a... It should be, these should be, this bone should be pointing right down that bone. I'm stuck here. There we go. And then this is a, there we go, well that one's, this is the normal one from the top. Um, and so this, this top is the same two bones that we're looking at. On this view, it doesn't necessarily have to be one line, but we want them to be parallel. And then we're looking at this joint here to make sure that it's, lined up and that's the basically a ball and socket that everything's that the sockets covering the ball and then this is a flat foot so you see these lines are no longer parallel and then this socket is no longer covering the ball so the scoops the, the cones kind of falling away from the ice cream 
A lot of times, too, I just like to show you that so you don't think I'm making stuff up. I can be like, look, something's wrong here. Um, so going through the stages briefly, um, the stage one is just when you have tendonitis or inflammation of that tendon. Um, you're, there's no deformity to it or your foot still looks normal. You just have pain in that area. You can have swelling there. Uh, you're able to do that straight leg, uh, or excuse me, single leg heel rise, meaning standing on one foot, going up on your heel. You can do that. The tendon works. It's just angry. Uh, stage two is when that tendon no longer works. And so that's when you start having the flat foot or actually looks different. Um, it's still flexible, meaning that when you sit down and I'm examining your foot, I can move it around and make it look like I want it to in terms of where it should be. Um, but then it goes back away from that on its own. Um, and then that you cannot go up on your heel. Stage three is when that kind of continues. And uh, I would say is that your foot's not working right, the tires are out of alignment, and so then they wear out faster so you get arthritis, and then it gets stuck there. And so that's called a rigid deformity, meaning it's flat. I sit you down, I can't move it, it stays there. No matter what I want to do, it stays out flat like that. And then uh, also you have sinus, ST is sinus tarsus. Basically you're having pain more in the joints rather than just in the tendons, and this is kind of when you start having pain on the outside part of the foot, like I mentioned. Um, and then the final one is somewhat controversial. It gets our, when we have our meetings, um, everyone gets real excited and argues about what this means and why this is stage four and what that actually is. But nevertheless, the important part is when eventually it puts stress on your ankle joint and then your ankle joint becomes abnormal too, not just the foot part. That complicates things as you'd imagine. So the reason I went over that, just talk about different treatment strategies, okay? So if it's flexible, we do what's called corrective bracing, meaning something that's gonna move you where it should be and hold you there. Uh, if we have to do surgery, if the conservative treatment doesn't work, which we always try first, we do surgery, it's called extra articular surgery. I'll show you what that means. Um, if it's rigid, then we do accommodative bracing, meaning that we're just trying to hold you there and limit the motion and try to make it more comfortable because we're not trying to put you back because your foot won't go anywhere else. Um, and then we do intraarticular surgery, and I'll explain that briefly. Um, so for stage one and two, when you come in first, what we do is we want that tendon to rest. Um, sorry, the arrows are a little messed up there, and the words, I apologize for that. But um, essentially, you want that tendon to rest. So we can start with what's a, like a lace-up brace. That's the picture down on the left. Goes in a regular shoe. If you still have pain with that, then we go to a boot. Uh, if you have pain even in the boot, then I tell you that you should try to stay off of it. And so we gotta get that tendon to cool off one way or the other. Um, we usually have, if you're able to take anti-inflammatories, like a lever Motrin, have you do that for a couple weeks, trying to get that to help, calm things down. And physical therapy can be helpful. Um, you know, I, I don't want you to get too aggressive in terms of strengthening yet until that tendon stops hurting, then you can focus more on that tendon. But generally stretching, inotophoresis, and basically different modalities that they have in terms of like ultrasound and medications and ice and stretching that can help kind of get the tendon cooled down and then start on strengthening afterwards. So the stuff that's jumbled up there, it's basically just saying that um, you know, oral or injectable steroids, again, are not a great option here uh, because it weakens that tendon and, and we're trying to get it to heal and, and keep it as uh, healthy and intact as possible. And so I typically don't recommend uh, steroids, either injections or um, like a Medrol dose pack. And then hopefully we get that calmed down and you're feeling better. And so then what do we do to keep it? We use something more, then we talk more about a, a orthotic, either off the shelf arch support or custom, depending on the situation um, and exact, the, spec, you know, the specifics of your foot. Um, or we can do some of the specialty shoe stores, have shoes that are kind of with built in arch supports now that are very helpful in that situation as well. Um, if that stuff doesn't work, we can do surgery. If it's stage one, tennis and evectivity just means we're cleaning up the tendon because it's still intact, it's just angry. Sorry, guys. Um, and then stage two is then we start doing what we call joint sparing reconstruction. So I have a couple. Oh, man, that's too bad. That's okay. Well, basically, the first one would show just the, uh, the flat foot like that other x-ray I showed you. I apologize again. It's not working. This is after surgery. Um, this is uh, um, 55. Uh, had the flexible flat foot. So basically, surgery, we keep the joints intact, but we have to cut bones and move them around and reshape things, move tendons around. Um, and basically everything still moves the same, but we're just reshaping things. Um, that's the surgery we type, we type of surgery we do for, for stage two. Um, if you come in with stage three or four, more of the rigid deformity, that's kind of treat that almost more like arthritis uh, because that's really what's going on and really what's causing the pain. The tendon typically doesn't hurt anymore. It's the arthritis that you're left with what's hurting you. So we do more bracing in the sense of 
accommodative bracing is your, your, your foot's stuck in that position, but we're trying to limit the motion there at that joint that's arthritic. And so different types of braces that we can do, both custom or uh, off the shelf, that can help limit that. And then anti-inflammatories, sometimes we can do cortisone injections for this problem because we're doing it for the joint, for the arthritis, much like you may have had for a knee um, or possibly a hip. Um, this type of surgery is a little bit more involved. Um, it's more intra-articular surgery. So again, this, this, just the, this is the afterwards x-ray. Um, this is when we have to go into those joints and then realign them and then fuse them together. And so there's no motion at those joints. But typically when we get to this part, you didn't have motion there anyway. And so we're not losing motion with surgery, but we're getting it lined up and stable. And so your foot works a little bit better and it gets rid of the pain. This patient was uh, 74, um, had some persistent uh, flat foot deformity and pain that wasn't working with bracing, and so um, had this surgery. Uh, this x-ray is four months after surgery. She's been walking in a regular shoe for about six weeks at that point and uh, I'm feeling good. And then again, briefly, stage four, uh, just, just to show some specifics or you know, um, go over it. This again, this is when it gets even more involved and a lot of times we have to do two surgeries. We have to stage it occasionally where we do one to address the foot, get that lined up and then um, go back and then sometimes have to address the ankle with different ways. This is a 73 year old male who had persistent flat foot um, despite bracing. That was the first surgery, did realign the foot. And then this is a total ankle replacement we did afterwards to address this ankle pathology. Um, Briefly, the atypical flat foot, that's more arthritis in the midfoot, causes instability and flattening there, um, even though the tendons can be working okay. And so again, that's why it's a little bit different treatment. Um, conservative first, we use a stiff-soled shoe with a rocker bottom. And so again, those joints in the middle of the foot aren't really supposed to move much. They don't move much in normal action. Um, but when they get arthritic, they move enough to hurt, which is kind of annoying. Um, but what you can do is a stiffer soled shoe is going to limit how much motion happens and flex through those joints. And so that limits pain if there's less motion through the arthritic joint. A lot of times I have a little bit of a rocker bottom, not necessarily like a beach ball or anything like that, but just a little bit of a curve so it allows you to still walk normally with a stiff sole. Anti-inflammatories, possibly a cortisone injection. And then surgery is similar to the second parts of the other one. If we need to do surgery, it's more fusing those joints, um, just getting them lined up and then doing surgery to stick, to keep them there. Um, sorry guys for the problems with that, but um, surgery to keep them there and lined up. And again, it doesn't really affect your motion. It sounds like it does with a fusion, but those joints aren't supposed to move anyway. So um, thank you guys. Sorry for the AV issues, but I appreciate your time. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Excuse me, sure. So associated with them, um, I don't uh, have a clinic in that building. Uh, my closest clinic here actually is the Brandon office at this point in time. Um, but I am same group, but just uh, different practice, different uh, locations. It's a good question. Um, so I tell patients a lot of times too to start is that um, I'm a surgeon. I love doing surgery. That's why I did all that um, training and everything and uh, I love doing it. But um, if it doesn't hurt that much, then don't let anyone do surgery on it. Um, you know, I can, sure I could make it lined up probably, but um, the callus is kind of the secondary problem from the shape of it, right? And so then that's just from extra pressure on an area that's not supposed to see pressure. Um, and that certainly can be painful when you get that callus there. Um, so I would say initially with that, you know, things to start with are depending exactly where it is and uh, how much mobility you have in your foot, um, different types of bracing or orthotics could, can help um, and limit that. Um, but, you know, I'd, if it's able to get lined up, you know, or just kind of pad that area and offload the pressure, um, that's what I would start with. Um, depends a little bit on the specifics, but of what kind of brace and that type of thing. But um, 
if it's mostly just a callus and you know it's you kind of are able to deal with it and maybe with braces a little bit better, um, I would do that. Um, surgery may help get it lined up and minimize the callus, but it just um, depends on how much it's really bothering you. And I would definitely start with the brace or something probably. So it probably was that tendon, um, and so sometimes it can kind of stretch and stretch, and then we'll have a pop, and essentially where it tears some, uh, and it just kind of stretches like if a rope, you know, partially tears and gets lengthened out, some of the strands pop. It could have, sometimes it does rupture all the way, um, but typically it doesn't. Um, but either way, that's, that's probably what it was. If then you had pain there, and then all of a sudden, then that you lost your arch. Um, that, that probably was part of it. Um, also, potentially could have been that if that tendon already was stretched out, there's a ligament that helps hold that the ice cream cone on the ice cream that I was kind of pointing to. There's a ligament that does that, and so usually that doesn't see much stress, but then if that tendon tears, that's the next thing that's trying to hold your foot in place, and so that may have popped, and that could have been it. But nevertheless, you know, certainly related to, I would, sounds like it's something like this. Yeah, I've tried insert, orthopedic insert. Yeah. Sometimes if it's, if it's a significant condition, then sometimes I have to start going up above the ankle in terms of more of like a brace type of thing to help hold things in, get control of the foot. Um, that's sometimes an option, just depends a little bit on the specifics of it though. Okay. Do you have a question here? First of all, thank you very much for coming Thank you for having me. Thank you. It can. It depends a little bit um, on the situation. Um, you know, I would say um, in general, if it's you've been able to walk and you have been walking, even though it's been difficult, um, it may take a little time more from uh, recovering the muscles and things like that. But um, not necessarily prohibitive in that sense. Um, um, but it doesn't necessarily preclude you from some type of possible surgery or bracing or anything like that. It just um, may add to things, but. Um, Um, I have some card. We have cards and things in, um, with our appointment line and um, some information about me that um, we'll have to hand out, and I can give you that as well. Thank you. Of course. And that's, so that's kind of just on the side. That's, that's why I do foot and ankle, um, because patients with situations like yourself. Um, and I, when I was doing training, I saw that there wasn't as much of that as some of the other subspecialties. And so um, that ob ability to potentially change things significantly, you know, and some may have been told by other people that, you know, oh, we can cut it off, but you know, obviously that's not an ideal situation. But um, so I'd be happy to uh, see if we can get you going. Of course, absolutely. Do we have a question here? Yes. I would like to know uh, what do you recommend for someone So the, in general, uh, the healthiest and most energy efficient way and kind of from the alignment of all the other joints and everything is to start with the heel and then kind of come through the top and then off the toes. Um, you know, that, that would be the most efficient. Sometimes other situations can make that more difficult than, than, uh, than it sounds. Um, so that's some kind of flexibility in that obviously, but I would say that to answer your question in terms of the best way, that's the most energy efficient way and puts the least amount of stress in other areas. Um, with that. Thank you, thank you. That is what we are brought from Tai Chi. All right, perfect. All right, I'm glad I didn't go against the Tai Chi master. I would have lost credibility there. <laughs> sure. Um, so Morton's neuroma, technically that, so that uh, there's nerves that go in between your toes, and so then there's the sensation out into your, um, the toes themselves. Um, and so Morton's neuroma is when you have an injury typically, something that for some reason that nerve swells or has some sort of injury. And so essentially a little scar ball is what a neuroma is. 
Um, and when it's in that toe, in your toes, in between, in the middle of your foot, it'd be like, kind of like in this part of your foot. Um, there's a ligament that's there that run, and there's not a lot of space. And so that neuroma or that scar ball can get pinched and squeezed, and um, nerves don't like to be pinched and squeezed, especially when they're already scar. Um, and so that's what, that's typically what that what that's caused by. Um, cannot there's a lot of overlap with it in terms of other conditions too, like like metatarsalgia, which is my fancy way of saying that the ball of your foot hurts when you walk on it. Um, also, can have inflammation in the joints there. Um, what I would tell you is that so classically, not always, but classically with the neuroma, it hurts more when you're in shoes and is better when you're barefoot. Um, if it's the opposite of that, it may be more of what metatarsalgia or something like that. Sometimes it can be, you know, both things going on. Um, but metatarsalgia typically is better in a shoe because it's more cushion on the bones. Um, but then the neuroma is everything squeezed together in a shoe. So that's why it's worse when you're in a shoe with a neuroma. Um, not a lot of great non-operative stuff for a neuroma um, other than just trying to find a shoe that's not kind of squeezed, and, but you allow you to do your thing. Um, you can do injections for that temporarily. Um, there is surgery for it if necessary. Um, for it's the, if it seems like it's the other thing where you say, hey, actually, well, it's better when I'm in shoes, it's worse when I'm barefoot or on you know, a harder floor, um, that may be more of a metatarsalgia. And then there's some over-the-counter type of... Say that word again, when it's better if you're in a shoe. If it's better when you're in a shoe, um, like probably more metatarsalgia, basically just painful met ball your foot. Um, that's just from, can be some from the shape of your foot, can some be, a lot of times people will argue that it's from calf tightness, because you're putting more pressure on the ball of your foot. A um, couple different things that contribute to it. There's some good over-the-counter things um, called a metatarsal pad, or if you look online, they're called a hay pad. A lot of drugstores have them too. This is like a sticker that's just a little pad. A lot of times it's kind of looks like a guitar pick. It's like a, kind of like a pizza slice. The key thing that I would give you a heads up on though with that is, um, it's a pad, but you don't want to put it where the where it hurts. You actually want to put it shy of that. So if it hurts on the ball of your foot, then you want the pad to be back here, because then that kind of is floating that bone that's tender, if that makes sense. And so um, a lot of times it's a sticker. It's split in half, right? You can peel both sides off. Peel off one side and put it where you think it is, and then walk around and kind of shift it. And then once you find the sweet spot, peel the other side off and put it there. Try that, and that's pretty, I mean, they're pretty cheap too. I mean, even if you have the neuroma, that could help too, because it kind of may open up the space a little bit. So I'd say starting with that either way is probably a good option. Do you recommend any specific brand of shoe, number one, number two, what do you think of flip-flops? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, I'm a Florida boy, so um, <laughs> flip-flops and barefoot's kind of my wheelhouse, but, um, so the, uh, it's a good question. I actually get asked that a good amount in terms of the shoes. I, I'm not sure of any specifics. What I would tell you is that from what I've seen is that more than um, one shoe being better than the other, um, it's, they're all kind of shaped a little different. And so some of them are wider generally than the other ones. Uh, some of them are more narrow. Some of them have a more of an arch support kind of built in. Some of them don't. Um, you know, a lot of things like that. Even within shoe company, for instance, not, I don't have any... Uh, ties or make money off any shoes, but like New Balance, you know, they have different models. Um, to me, I would say that the best thing is trying to find what works for you. Um, I don't have necessarily a, a golden, you know, or silver bullet, so to speak, with it, but um, there's a lot of the, you know, a lot of good shoes out there. Um, uh, one brand that I tell people uh, a lot um, that, again, don't have stock or anything, but um, people like, for instance, with like the midfoot arthritis that I talked about or kind of limiting the motion, could argue that for plantar fasciitis it may be helpful also. It's like a Hoka is one brand. It's not as common as like Nike or uh, Adidas, things like that. But they, I know for a fact, they have a good shoe that's a very stiff bottom that's kind of rounded. It's a good walking shoe and kind of protects things. And um, typically people that I've met that have gotten those are very happy. Bionics are good. A lot of people love those that get them. Those are usually more for people that need arch support. Um, they seem to be a little bit more built in with arch support, but patients seem to, that I've had, you know, that, that's a very popular brand. What brand did she mention? Uh, Hoka, H-O-K-A. That's what you mentioned. What was oh, she, Vionics. Vionics, yeah. There's a few that, that, um, that they carry now that kind of are geared in this niche of, that I, you know, the made for people with, you know, like a sandal, for instance, like a flip-flop. They, for instance, I know Vionics has 
flip-flops that are have an arch support built in because you can't wear an arch support in a sandal that you buy off the shoe, you know, so they have some built in. So I know patients have, I've heard them before say that they couldn't wear flip-flops before, but they can wear that kind. A yeah, good thing about shoes is that they're not custom and so you can go try them on and walk around the store rather than putting some money forward for a custom orthotic and then crossing your fingers that it's going to help. Not, not, I mean, I don't have a problem with them. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I think, it, you know, there's some conditions or some situations where I may tell you that it's probably not the best idea. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you're able to do what you want to do and it's not prohibitive from what, it, you know, I don't think there's necessarily a problem with that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you have to wear dress shoes or, you know, sneakers if you don't like them. Just, you know, but if you can do what you want to do in the sandals, you say, I mean, it hurts a little bit, but... I wouldn't tell you you shouldn't do anything. Sure. Um, what I would say with that potentially, the first thing that I would guess would be the midfoot arthritis t situation that I talked about. Typically that's where patients complain more of pain on the top of the foot rather than the bottom. Um, kind of in the middle of the foot on the top, probably worse. Where the laces go. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and then uh, that area, exactly. That's where those joints are that we call the midfoot arthritis area. Um, I would say if it's probably worse when you're barefoot. Um, you know, if you have a stiffer shoe, it's a little bit better, that kind of thing. That, that all points to that, um, an arthritic situation. And so with that, I would say, you know, the best thing to start with with that specifically is those shoes that are going to be a stiffer bottom with a little bit of a rounded nature to it. Um, and then, you know, anti-inflammatories, either topical or oral, can help in general with that. Um, but treating it like an arthritis rather than a um, tendon problem, I think, is, is where I would start. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay. And uh, my pain is in the ankle part, not in the uh, foot. Is there anything that can be done? And arthritis is set in as a result. What do you recommend for that? Because it's a little bit of walking and it just becomes extremely painful. Sure. Um, yeah, and that's so interestingly um, to talk about that. Just so. Um, different from knee and hip arthritis, so the most common cause of ankle arthritis is post-traumatic. So the, by far the most common reason people is from either one big injury, like a fracture or something like that, or multiple injuries over time. People say like, well, you know, I played volleyball or whatever, and I had tons of ankle sprains and that kind of thing. And so um, it does sound probably like an ankle arthritis situation. With that, um, you know, there are some braces that can help limit motion uh, there. Uh, again, injections are an option with that, anti-inflammatories. Um, and then from a, um, a surgical standpoint, if those don't work, there's two main options um, for ankle arthritis, which is a fusion or a replacement. Uh, both are good surgeries in different situations. Um, but I would say that that's kind of the end game for you. Um, but trying to find a, um, a brace um, is an option. Um, the lace-up ones that you can get over the counter, usually more for side-to-side -side motion, which may help you depending on the situation. Um, that's an option to try. And, um, other than that, if it's more, it seems that it's more of the kind of forward back motion that bothers you, sometimes actually those same shoes uh, can help because if your ankle's stiff and it doesn't want to move this way, but the rounded bottom allows you to kind of still have some motion in that plane from heel to toe walking, that may, you may find that that's a little bit more comfortable for you. Um, but it depends a little bit on the situation, but I'd say those would probably be the two first things I would start with. But. But there are, you know, surgical options if it comes to that, too. We have a question here, and then I'm probably going to make that one the last one so that we can set up for the next presenter. And then Dr. Lowy will be out in the lobby if you have follow-up questions. Go ahead. Well, um, I think it's called neuropathy. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations for that when you can't feel your feet? Um, not, not a lot of great options from, from that. I mean, if it's painful, there's some nerve medicines that, that are options. If you have pain in the, in the feet that's from neuropathy, 
there's some nerve medicines that, that are possibly helpful. Um, but in terms of, do you mean just to like get the sensation back or what? Well, he said, no, he said he can't feel the speech. Uh-huh. Yeah, then that, I mean, just honestly, the most important thing for that is, is to make sure that don't develop a wound or anything like that. Um, and so not really much can do, unfortunately, in terms of getting back sensation typically. Um, but it's more of a preventative in the sense of making sure that you don't have, get a, a sore or a wound there that you can't feel that can, can progress and get it become a problem. Um, I mean, it can be helpful for keep, you know, gait, walk and training and balance and things like that to kind of help make sure you have everything together um, from that standpoint. Um, not necessarily directly for regenerating the nerves, um, but it's important that can help to kind of make sure you, you don't lose your balance when you can't feel the before and things like that. Uh, I was, I'm not sure. What's that? What was the last part? Oh, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know specifically of you know of you know like a study on that, but I, I would say it certainly would be a concern. Anything like that that's unstable on your foot could increase risk of a fall. Um, you know that it's not going to be a sturdy ground. You know, and so that's why sometimes you know like loose rugs and things like that on the ground or uneven ground. So similar to a flip flop, you could be at risk of falling. I mean. Sometimes maybe maybe a little bit better if there's one that has a strap on the heel, so it's a sandal but not a flip-flop, so to speak. Um, but I would be careful if you're having issues with that. Um, I want to make sure you have a good fitting shoe. Yes, I got what they call uh, drop foot. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can do for? Um, well, so the I mean the first thing to start typically, and you may or have this is uh, um, is there's some braces to kind of help prevent it from dropping down to trip. Um, so beyond a brace, I mean there are depending on exactly the nature of it and why and other muscle strength around it. There's potentially options from a surgical standpoint, but typically the first thing to start with is is a brace that will keep allow you to how lift up because the concern with the drop foot is that when you're walking you can't bend your ankle up and then you trip on it because your toes are hitting the ground. And so there's braces that you can get that are even over the counter and not necessarily custom um, that kind of keep your foot from dropping down. And that's, I mean, that's the easiest and the first place to start. That's called a, a, an AFO, or an ankle foot orthosis. But, but, you know, if you don't have no control of that foot. Yeah. yeah, there's some things, unfortunately, there's not really, even if it gets to a surgical thing with drop foot, um, that's one of those situations where there's things that we can do to help that problem, but it doesn't necessarily get it back to normal. Um, and and uh, essentially kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, in terms of using other muscles or tendons that do work to substitute for the one that's not working. Um, but again, obviously, if you imagine we're taking it from somewhere else, and so it's not, you know, things don't get back to normal, um, but sometimes we can make it so that you don't have to wear a brace. Um, and, and still have your foot up. Um, but um, typically the easiest thing in terms of first way to start is with a brace um, that, that will help kind of keep your foot from dropping down. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you, guys. Thank you.